Hey everybody, it's Aaron. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, on today's episode, I have a little surprise from eWaste. If you like IBM computers and especially IBM early keyboards like the Model M and the Model F, you are going to like what's on today's episode. Oh, and by the way, I think I'm going to need a lot more cleaning solution as well. What is it and how much did I pay for it? Well, you're going to find out right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Retro Hack Shack and welcome to another edition of E-Waste Wednesday, or as I like to call it, Ew. Ew, this is so cringe. Guilty. And what I found today really does classify for Ew. We'll see that in just a minute. Um, and things are a little bit askew in the shack, if you will, because I'm installing some neat little lights uh, over there on that side. And I'm going to do the same over here. I'm right in the middle of that project. So, uh, yeah, that'll be coming, uh, soon, but I'm not stopping videos just because I have things all in disarray here. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get to the first item that I found. Here is the first item up for bids on our show. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see from the angle that you're on, uh, but this is a, some sort of a clone, uh, PC. It might be a clone of a 5150 by the looks of it, um, but it doesn't have the IBM badge up here. It has these mountains, these three mountains. I'm not sure what logo that is. I'm not sure I've ever seen that one before, but uh, perhaps I can look that up and see what this is. But it certainly looks like an IBM computer and it's very solid, but it is very, very dirty as you can see. So that's one thing I found and clones aren't too uncommon. You find those at e-waste quite a bit. Um, usually get a good deal on those because they don't have the IBM badge. Uh, but that's not the only thing I found. Let's bring that next item up for bids right out here in front of them. The next thing I found is this. This is an IBM product, official IBM product. And this is an IBM 5154 EGA monitor. Now these things are pretty rare. Um, they, they have been failing. They're difficult to find these days. And I have one of them, but it just failed again after I fixed it the first time. So I'm really hoping that this 5154 monitor works. Uh, the great thing about it is you can hook it up to, uh, it's backwards compatible. So you can hook it up to an MDA signal, a CGA signal, or an EGA signal and get some of those really good classic graphics. So yeah, I'm hoping that this one works because as I've mentioned before on the channel, it's always good to have two of something. If you can have two Commodore 64s, one working, one not, or in this case, two 5154 monitors, one working, one not, then it's much easier to debug the one that's not working because you can look at the one that's working, measuring, measure the voltages, the signal strength, the, you can even break out your oscilloscope, take a look at the wave patterns. Um, and then compare that to the one that's not working. It makes it a lot easier, a lot easier to figure out what the problem is. So yeah, so we have this uh, clone uh, IBM type PC down here at the bottom and then an official IBM 5154 monitor um, that I found as well. But that's not all. The next item up for bids that'll cause great excitement is right over here. I also found one, one buckling spring keyboard. Two, two buckling spring keyboards. Three, three buckling spring keyboards. Four, four buckling spring keyboards. Ah! I forget what the count used to sound like on uh, Sesame Street, something like that. That's my impression. So yeah, I found uh, these uh, keyboards there as well. These are, these top two are Model M's and they're different vintages. So we'll have to take a look at these and see, uh, where they, you know, what time period they come from. But they're the, this one has the old logo. That one has the old logo and it's in a square on that side. So that's even older. Anyway, we'll get into that in a little bit, but this is almost even more exciting to me than the monitor because I had one Model M keyboard in my collection. Uh, they, uh, they actually fetch a pretty good price sometimes on eBay and around, especially these older ones. 
Yeah, I mean, they go for at least a hundred bucks a piece. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the back of the clone computer here. There is one card in here. I can see through this card slot. There's at least one card. Maybe that's the floppy controller because there's obviously a floppy drive in the front. Uh, right here, it says property of Permenos Corporation. Permenos. So they actually have one of those foil stickers on it. I'll have to look up Permenos and see what that is. And then over here, of course, we have the power supply with the, hey, wait a second. IBM? Is that, did somebody, wait a second. Did somebody take, okay, wait a second, wait a second. Is this an actual sticker or did this come from something else? It does say right here, 5170. What the heck? Could this be an actual 5170 IBM computer? Oh, weird. Now my interest is really peaked. What the heck is going on? Okay, so I was just going to say that uh, the um, uh, monitor would plug in here. So the, you'd get your pass-through power, your pass-through AC power. Uh, would You'd be able to plug that in here. And then um, this is really low. This case is really low to the ground. So I bet if we looked on the bottom, I'm not sure I want to do that, but if we looked on the bottom, I bet the the, uh, the feet on the bottom of this case are gone, unfortunately. And it's leaving marks on my nice new painted table, which I don't like, but it's a workbench. You know, it's going to go, it's going to get marks on it eventually anyway. So no big deal, but yeah, that's too bad. And it is filthy, by the way. I don't know if you can see, actually on camera, it looks like it's pretty clean. Uh, hang on, let me tilt the camera up here. Um, it looks like there was a monitor up here. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then there was some like water that leaked out or something. There's like a monitor uh, uh, stain or something like that. And then down here in the corner, there's all kinds of gunk and like bugs and gross stuff on here. So uh, yeah, when we open this up, I expect to find probably more than a few of those on the inside as well. And here's the front of the case again. And this is where it gets interesting because... Did IBM ever have this mountain logo? Or is maybe this is the logo of the company and they switched the case badge out? Maybe they made their own custom uh, uh, case badges for this? Maybe this is a 5170. So yeah, look at this right here. This is a, a picture of an authentic 5170, even including the 5154 uh, EGA monitor. And you can see this pattern down here. Sorry, I'm moving this around a bit. Um, you can see this pattern down here of the grill and this part up here, the case badge and where the floppy drives and potentially hard drives go over here. And look at that. That looks exactly like a 5170 PC. What would this be? A PC AT, I think. The 5170 was the first AT, right? 5160 would have been the first XT. I think 5170 was the first AT. Um... But yeah, and look at this case badge. What the heck is that? So if this is an authentic 5170, um, then yeah, that would have been introduced in 1984. Um, it included a six megahertz um, Intel 286 processor and a 1.2 megabyte floppy drive. Let's open it up and see what's inside. Yeah, this is definitely some sort of floppy controller here on this side. I don't think there's a hard drive. I think there's just a floppy drive and that's it. Um, but yeah, this is looking more and more like a uh, 5170. There's a lithium ion battery here. Those things are known to explode, although not as bad as the uh, nickel cadmium or nickel metal hydride, um, the alkaline ones. Um, but that should probably come out. It looks like a six volt battery. Oh, look at this. It's got bugs back here. Spider webs full of bugs and stuff. Oh. In true IBM fashion, they have these uh, um, slotted screws. No Phillips screws. No modern day conveniences. You know, this card is in there good. Uh, one thing I'm noticing is this does have the extended ISA bus in here. The 16-bit. I guess it's technically it's the 16-bit ISA bus. Oh, there we go. Full-size card in this thing. I would have thought they would have had a short card in here. 
But there we go. Definitely looks like an IBM part here. 1501868, I think is what that says. And it's got some uh, ceramic uh, pieces in here. This is a Western Digital, 1983 Western Digital um, card. And then there's an Intel chip over here too. That looks pretty interesting. Um, and another West Western Digital uh, card over here, or a chip over here. So yeah, IBM did their part numbers like this. They didn't put like what it was. I doubt we'll find anything on here saying floppy disk controller. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. So, you know, early cards from back here, sometimes you really have to search for what these things are. Oh, here it is right here. A fixed disk floppy uh, diskette, fixed disk and floppy diskette. So was this a combination MDM and floppy controller? Maybe. Uh, I'll look this up and see what it is, but that's pretty cool um, that that card is in here. And they're making use of that uh, 16 bits, the extra bits back here on the bus. So that's pretty cool. And there's even an IBM factory bodge wire here. Nice. All right, and here's a close-up of the processor. It says IBM on it, but it also says Intel. I believe that says Intel 84 perhaps over there. Um, and right here it says, I believe, CC or CG80286. I'm almost positive this is an official 5170 and not a clone at all. So cool. So I, I don't know. I'm kind of tempted to try to fire this up and see if it works. Um, on my clone, um, I did have an IBM. I think it was like a 5160 clone, uh, something in that vintage. Um I did kind of go through my troubleshooting process, which is to test the power supply first, check for shorts on the board um, and things like that before I do anything. So if something blows, there's a lot of tantalums on here all over the board. Oh, and it's missing a memory chip. So I do need to find an extra memory chip. That's interesting. Why would it be missing just one? I'm not sure if you can see that or not, but it's, it's fully populated. Um, it should have... Uh, at least 512k of RAM, but it's missing just that one chip up there that somebody, maybe somebody pillaged it. Maybe somebody pulled that out and used it in something else. I'll have to see if I have another chip. Um, but it should, we should still be, if that's the only thing wrong, we should be able to boot it up and get to a prompt that says there's a memory error at least. But, uh, yeah, before I do that, I need to clean or at least blow this thing out and test the power supply. Okay, so I've hooked up a spare hard drive. I don't even know if this is working. Uh, it's just an old IDE 160 gig hard drive. Hook that up just to generate some load so that hopefully this uh, power supply will boot up or uh, start up and we can test the rails on it. So let's just turn it on real quick. I've got it plugged in. Let's turn it on and see, uh, see if I get any smoke or anything else. Let's see. Okay. That's interesting. We get absolutely nothing. Why is that? No go, no juice at all. So right away, first blocker, we have a problem with the power supply itself. So that's where I'm gonna stop. We'll have to come back to this and I'll do a dedicated episode on resurrecting this 5170 beauty from IBM. Okay, so now I wanna focus on just seeing if I can get this 5154 monitor to work. And unlike the 5151 that I repaired on a previous episode, I can link that one up above, where the um, e-waste people had cut off. There was a built-in power cable, uh, meaning soldered on to the, the main board, and a built-in video cable on that one. And so I had to I had to do both, uh, replace the, the power cable and replace the video signal cable. In this case, um, these monitors had an IEC, standard IEC plug, so that's easy to plug in. Here's, I will have to redo this video signal cable uh, at some point, but what I want to do first is just go ahead and plug it in and see if I can detect any high voltage, uh, which you can usually hear. You might not be able to hear it on the video, but you can usually hear that. You can maybe get some static on the front of the screen. If that's the case, then um, I'll feel pretty good about that the monitor will work. Um, and if not, again, might be another whole video on troubleshooting this thing, but uh, let's plug it in and see if we get any high voltage. There's no power on the video cable. It's just the signals for the various colors and sinks and everything 
and the uh, ground reference. So I don't have to worry about the fact that this is cut off and maybe you know some signals are connected. Um, that there's no voltage there, so we should be okay to just plug it in like that. Okay, so it's plugged into power. Let's turn it on, see if we get high voltage or maybe some smoke will appear. We'll see. Let's see what's going on here. Oh, yeah. Yes, this that sounds great. Um, I heard the degausser come on. I'm getting high voltage. Uh, there's some static on the screen. And look at that. I know it doesn't look like much, but that is a really good sign. That's telling me that most likely, it looks like it might need some adjustments, but it's telling me that if I hooked a signal up to this, more than likely, this is gonna work out of the box. Well, out of the box, straight from e-waste. Okay, it should go without saying, but I always like to make sure for new people that are watching this video for maybe the first time they understand, I'm just about to take this apart but there is high voltage in here, please uh, be careful and know what you're doing before you start working with CRTs. Uh, lots of high voltage, could be dangerous. It'll definitely make you stand up and take notice. Don't open this up unless you know what you're doing. So I covered this in some of my other videos, um, but there is the video processing, signal processing part of the monitors over on this side in its own separate cage. Power supply is over on this side in its own separate cage. And then we have the driver, like the horizontal driver, vertical driver stuff. That's, if I remember correctly, that's all kind of on the bottom here. So I'm gonna have to take this apart a little bit in order to get to this cable and um, splice in a new one. And let's just demonstrate and see if there's actually any voltage left in the CRT. This has been sitting off for a good 10 or 15 minutes now. Uh, since I had it powered in and turned on. So let's just see, there shouldn't be any voltage left. I wouldn't expect there to be any, but it's a good test. Um, you know, IBM probably put in a lot of safety precautions, um, I would think, and they probably have a you know good amount of bleed um, resistance put in there somewhere so that it bleeds off the CRT or something pretty quickly, but you know, you never know. And for this, you want to make sure that, at least with the probe I'm using, I wanna make sure that the ground is connected to one of the ears of the CRT out here. And then I'm just going to stick this probe into underneath the cap here and touch the anode part and just see if we get any voltage on the probe. And yeah, I'm getting nothing, nothing at all. So, yep, as I expected, this thing is fully discharged. Always good to know before you start working on these. Okay, well, if you saw my repair of the 5151 monochrome monitor, uh, I'm using a very similar technique here to reconnect the cable onto the back of the 5154 monitor, I'm taking the panels off of this, uh, the uh, video signal board here, or the panels off the grounding anyway around there so I can get access to them. And then I was able to, with my multimeter, uh, trace out, here's where the, um, I figured out where the uh, cable connects to this board, and it's right over here. Pulled up a schematic and uh, figured out what the mapping was between where this connects to the board and where it needs to connect on the uh, video cable connector, which pin goes to which signal. And uh, then I was able to map out the colors here, and I can't find my cable. I should have the other half of that cable I used for that 5151 monochrome monitor, I should have that around somewhere, but I can't find it. So what I've done for now is I've just hooked this up to uh, this little thing I like to use, um, uh, which gives me like uh, screw terminals here to screw into these wires. So now I should be able to connect this up to a working computer and we should be able to see if this monitor works. And I've got a 5151, or excuse me, an IBM 5150, the original PC, is over there on my uh, shelf. So I will hook that up and we'll see if we get anything on the monitor. And then I can come back later and attach that cable and get everything buttoned up nicely. But I just wanna see if this, if inputting a signal into this will actually give me a picture. Okay, well, this is kind of a good sign. I mean, this is close. This could be the result of me getting a few wires crossed. I'll have to go out back and check <clears throat> make sure I have all of the uh, the wires connected to the right signal. It also just could be the vertical or horizontal uh, refreshes off, but I, I see that the I'm getting the, the signal from the 5150 because I can see the, the lines. I recognize what that's supposed to look like. So 
Yeah, it looks like I swapped two of the wires here. Uh, let me swap those back around. Ah, already looking better. Look at that. Bada bing, bada boom. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, I've gone ahead and turned the studio lights off. Um, so hopefully you can see just how sharp and nice that looks. It's looking really, really good. Um, I just had a couple of my wires crossed. <laughs> no surprise there. But yeah, that's all it was. Just hook up the uh, uh, the cable, replace that cable that they cut off at e-waste, and it's looking like it's working just fine. Let me pull up a quick color palette, and we'll see what that looks like. Okay, while I was troubleshooting the color problem, I discovered something I never realized before, and maybe some of you didn't either, um, or I'm sure a lot of you do, but there is a contrast knob. I've still got the lights turned off, so you can't really see it very well, but um, down here there's a contrast knob, and I noticed when I changed the contrast knob, the value of the contrast knob, it didn't change anything on the screen. And so I was looking in the manual. Of course, you should always RTFM. But when I was looking in the manual, I discovered that this control pops out. If you pull it forward, then you have uh, uh, contrast control from the knob. But if you push it backwards, the contrast is controlled by a pot in the back that you can move around. And so watch what happens when I pull this forward. I don't know if you can see that, but the colors are much more aligned to where they're supposed to be now. Um, the brown is definitely brown. The dark gray is actually darker than the light gray. So yeah, I'm glad I found that out because the contrast really affects the colors. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push this back in and then try to adjust that in the back and get it to align with, with this one when I pull this out, that color there. Oh yeah, there it goes. See that? Yeah, look at that. Much better. Let's see if it's matching now. Uh, it's a little bit lighter, so I'll just make it a little darker until can't tell any difference. There we go. There. Perfect. Now those match. It's very close to what I think those colors should be. And uh, yeah, now this monitor is ready to rock and roll. Well, still needs to be cleaned, but at least it's working and working great. So let's take a look at these keyboards a little bit. And this is the oldest one. And I know that right away just by looking at it because it doesn't have the uh, uh, number lock, scroll lock uh, LEDs up here. And if you look very closely right over here, you'll see it says IBM Personal Computer. Uh, but yeah, it says IBM Personal Computer, not Personal Computer XT, not Personal Computer AT, the original personal computer that was sold by IBM in 1981, which led to the PC revolution, I guess you could say. And just look at how dirty this is. I mean, this is unbelievably dirty. I think all this stuff was probably kept in a shed or something. Uh, so it's amazing that any of it still works. And this thing is extremely heavy. It's made of metal. Um, and you can see that better on the back. There's no stickers on the back. There should be feet here, and I think I do have replacements for those. So I've got some replacement feet, which once this is all cleaned up and ready to go, I'll put these replacement cork feet on here, the original PC, and uh, I think some other ones in, you know, that were released after this, and the, even the keyboards had these cork feet on them, which is kind of cool. But I've got some replacements for those, so once I clean this up, I'll put those on. But if you look closely here, you can start to see some rust. My son made mention of that. Um, he's like, Dad, these keyboards are rusting. He's like not used to seeing keyboards that are actually made of metal. So yeah, I think we should probably take, well, I know I'm going to have to take this apart and clean it. Uh, but before I do, let's look at the other keyboard. Oh, and one other thing is the feet. So Model F stick out like a sore thumb because they have these feet on here that are actuated. They prop up the keyboard, but they're actuated by these little knobs, and then they have a spring there. And so if you wanted to tilt your keyboard up, that's how you would do it. And then to put it down, you'd have to press in uh, and turn it back down. <laughs> Sorry, very mechanical and, uh, yeah, kind of difficult at this point because everything, I'm sure, is so crudded up in there. 
Okay, this is keyboard number two, and this one actually says personal computer AT. So this is definitely the computer that goes with that 5170. And uh, you can see that things have changed a little bit. The uh, There's an alt key over here, a caps lock key over here, and yeah, uh, caps locks, num key, and scroll lock up top here, illuminated by these LEDs, and it's starting to look a little bit more like a traditional, like we would know a traditional keyboard today, but just look how dirty that is. Oh my goodness. Sure enough, if we flip this over, we can see that there is a now a, uh, a serial number or something on the back or stock number, something like that, model number maybe, I don't know. And then over here we have the uh, Premenos and a uh, sticker. So this is an asset tag that they used. And the same kind of uh, feet here. Let's see if these work at all. Oof. Yeah, there's something wrong here. This is this has been dropped or something because this is pushed in and the case is actually coming out. So again, this one will actually need some work too. Um, and the other thing I noticed about this is check out how long the cord is. Look at that. That is one long cord. I don't know how long that is. It's at least six feet, maybe maybe 10 or 12 feet long. Um, so yeah, super long cord with this. I'm not sure if that was the case with all of this model uh, keyboard or not, but uh, yeah, this one's not quite as in bad shape, but I'm glad I have it because it does match that 5170. And now we're starting to get into the Model M's. People love these keyboards for the sound that they make, along with the Model F's that I was just showing. These keyboards have a buckling spring. Oops, that key's sticking a little bit but they make a really, really loud sound. If you have a full-size keyboard, it's gonna look probably something like this, even though this was 38 years ago that this keyboard came out. It is missing a couple of the keycaps here and here, um, and those can be replaced. You can actually source new keycaps and uh, you can actually replace, replace these. And if we look on the back here, there's the uh, uh, part number, serial number, date, this says, even though it says IBM Corporation 1984, it's this came out in uh, 05 November of 86. And it does say Model M right on the back there. And it has an interesting, it's like a removable, I don't know if I can get this out. It has a square uh, plug over here. I don't want to damage anything. Yep, there we go. So it's got a, a square plug, kind of like a, uh, uh, almost like an ethernet cable. Um, that goes in the back here. So that's a, a little bit different than I'm used to seeing. The feet on this keyboard, um, they kind of pop up. Oops, how does that even go down now? Does it, oh, yeah, it's pretty hard, but it just goes down. Um, you only get one one option there, no, no uh, multiple options for raising the keyboard up and down. And look at this, it comes with, I thought most Model Ms, and I guess most of them are, were uh, PS2 keyboards, but this one is most likely an AT keyboard because it has a big five pin DIN. And this is the last keyboard I picked up. So about it, this is looks like to be to me a little bit later uh, keyboard because it has the round IBM badge over here. And uh, the other one had a square IBM badge on this side. But uh, other than that, it looks pretty similar. It is missing a couple of keycaps. Like I said, no big deal. There's another one here. Those can be replaced, luckily. Um, when you do buy those though, um, it's hard to get them to match. I had to replace a couple on my, the Model M that I uh, um, owned before, these four <laughs> keyboards. And uh, yeah, you just gotta be careful because um, sometimes the lettering will look a little different if you want an exact match. And sometimes the, uh, the obviously the shading of the uh, plastics here, you know, over time, these plastics have yellowed and darkened and things like that. And so you don't always get an exact match, but you can get pretty close. Turning this over, we have a similar feel. It looks like there was a spot on both of these for a, a speaker here. I didn't realize that, uh, that's the only thing I can think of that would go in there. And I didn't realize that they ever thought about putting a speaker in the keyboard. Um, but this also was made, let's see, this was a year later. So 18th of September, 1987, but it still has the same square type plug to plug in the keyboard on this end. And then this end on this side, this is another really long cable. So I don't know if this was an option to get this long cable or what, but let's look how long that is. Super long cable. And this one does uh, now have the PS2 end on it. 
So yeah, I know AT and PS2 are pretty much the same, I think, uh, or very, very close. So I wonder if, um, I wonder if maybe you could change the cable out here and go to and change these up for AT versus PS2. I don't know. Um, interesting to think about that, but it also has this square connector and oh, it's coming out. There it is. Exactly the same connector that was in the other keyboard. So these two keyboards are very similar. Really the biggest difference is the placement of that logo, I think. So now the question you've all been waiting for, how much did this actually cost? Well, um, let's talk about how much these things are worth. So this is probably a monitor, the EGA monitor. These are getting more and more rare. This is probably worth a good two to $300 at this point, I would say, just because they are really hard to find. Um, the 5170, probably not as much. I would say the 5170 probably would go for between $100 and $200, only because it is an original IBM. If it was a clone, it would be less than that. And then the keyboards really have varied over time. Um, last time I looked, they were going for about $100, I think. Um, and they could range anywhere from 100 to 300. The Model Fs are actually uh, uh, more rare and so more expensive. So Model M, Model F, you know, each of these would go for at least $100. Granted, there's a lot of work that I have to put into these because they are very dirty, but I know the monitor's working now. I have pretty good hopes that I can get the 5170 working, and I also have pretty good hopes that all the keyboards will be working. They really just need to be really, really cleaned. I mean, these things are disgusting. It looks like they came out of a shed or a barn or something. So yeah, all in, I got all of these for the grand total price of $35. Um, and I know that I'm really lucky. A lot of you have told, have told me that you can't get deals like that, or more often even that your e-waste, local e-waste place doesn't even sell stuff that they get in. They just send it off and have it uh, demolished and, and perhaps scavenge the metal or something like that. So some of you have told me that you can't even get this stuff at your local e-waste place. So I do feel really, really lucky, A, that I have this available as a resource for me and for the channel, and B, because the folks that work there don't overprice their stuff. They actually sell it at a really, really reasonable rate. So I'm super lucky, and I do recognize that fact. So anyway, that's it for this episode. I hope you like it. I am going to have a follow-up episode where I restore one of the Model F keyboards at least. And so I'll be putting that out as a separate video. Uh, but until then, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary, and of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.